Welcome to the Goodman Reopened. We are thrilled after six months of being closed due to COVID-19 to be able to be open virtually for you, for our beloved members, for our special guests, for our sponsors, and for our community. This beautiful historic 1901 Luther Turton building has really seen a lot in the last 120 years, as has our community. Each time we become stronger, smarter, more resilient to take on the next. In the beginning of this, this presentation tonight, you saw Dr. Shelley O. Smith, who opened tonight's event with her words of experience and wisdom. She brought this exhibit titled, Who Tells Our Story? From Concept to Life, with our guest curator, Dr. Monica Hunter, with our assistance of our research librarian, Mikhail Briggs, with our intern, Kelly O'Connor, and our devoted volunteers. I also must thank our sponsors. Without our sponsors, we could not do this. We would not be able to present this beautiful exhibit. Arcadia Press, The Doctor's Company, Aegis Living Napa, and Congregation of Beth Shalom. Thank you very, very much. Though the Goodman doors have been closed, we have been working very hard, nonstop, to carry on the mission of discovery, preservation, and education of Napa County history and its place in California and its place in this world. And keeping history alive while being relevant and fun. Such as the wonderful bird's eye view you just witnessed from a drone video provided by Eric Osterley and Rob Dowdy. Thank you, gentlemen. Before we start, it's time to review, review our COVID guidelines. You'll see that I'm wearing a face cover, just as they did back in 1918. This is not our first time in a pandemic here in Napa. So we're wearing a face cover. We have limited people inside the building for this event. Everybody's being mindful and keeping social distance. So I want to let you know that and reassure you of that. Now, let's talk about um, potential technical issues. This, in this new age of virtual almost everything, we're in this historic building, and therefore we may run into some technical difficulties. If your monitor freezes, be patient. We will do our best to get it, to re, to get it um, worked through. And Mikhail Riggs is working behind the scenes to do that for you. If we completely drop off, try to reboot to the link provided, and if not, we will send you a video recording of this whole presentation. On to the fun, and that is the agenda and why we're here tonight. We will start our tour in the foyer with a new timeline with Dr. Monica Hunter. Next, we'll enter into the Jetsdale Memorial Room and we'll meet our two wonderful local historians, Scott Sedgley and Don Winter. We will close with a toast and a message from our board of director, Danielle Barreca. Are we ready? Let's go and let's meet Dr. Monica Hunter. Hello. 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 It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you, um, Dr. Hunter. Dr. Hunter comes to us from San Luis Obispo. She um, has, she's a cultural anthropologist maritime anthropologist, former educator is my understanding too, and just a love of California history. And we are thrilled and honored that you are here and you've been our guest curator for this exhibit. Um, speaking of, this is new. We have never had a timeline in the Goodman building. And the first thing I notice as I look at this timeline, and I so appreciate Dr. Hunter, is that it goes back to 8,000 years ago. You know, when, we, when our first people were here. So it reflects that, and it comes down to 1700. And I also know, before it continues forward, and I also notice what I really love about this, it shows the comparison and contrast of local history on this left side and above the timeline with national and global history on the right side and on the bottom of the timeline. Mm -hmm. So we can really connect and look at the trends and the pivotal moments that are happening, happening you know, coincidentally. Yes. So that is wonderful. I also notice, and I know, that we're really focusing today on this timeline from 1830, mm -hmm. 
We start here to 1930 it starts there. And as Dr. Shelley O. Smith would say, it's a wink of an eye of time, and it is. But so much has happened during that time. In terms of looking at this timeline, anything that really sticks out to you? Yeah, actually, you know, it's looking at the 1980s. And in the valley, the Pacific Union College was established at Angwin, uh, which was quite a remarkable event to occur. Also, the Yachtville Veterans Home was built in 1884, which was a very important, not only was a very important facility serving a big need for veterans uh, from the Spanish-American War and other early wars, but also, a real highlight there, in 1889, the crude wine puts Napa on the map. Yes. They took the Pan American Fair gold medal in Paris. Yeah. So that was quite a moment. People knew about Napa after that. But if you look at what was happening in the world at large, Louis Pasteur discovered the vaccine for cholera. And certainly today, as we look at the pandemic and all of the ways in which we have put all of our resources and all of our special uh, specialists and knowledge and science trying to develop a vaccine as quickly as possible so that our communities can restore their uh, normal activities and hopefully businesses will, will survive and, and flourish once again once we have our vaccine. I think there's probably another couple of items on this wall you are interested in. Yeah, I really, you know, now that we're in 2020, it's been real challenging as we know, and we know this timeline will show other challenges that we've overcome here in the county and worldwide. But in 1920, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's really interesting that Mr. Gasser, young Gasser, who the Gasser Foundation is so um, important to this community, what they've given to this community, and and so in 1926 we have a Mr. Gasser, a young Gasser, and they were responsible for the first uh, grass runway airport that was on Sauceful, which I have no idea. I love that. Um, in addition, um, Park Victoria, which was the first hospital in Napa was opened in 1929. So that was really important. Um, and then looking at it nationally, I'm so proud that in 1920, women were actually allowed to vote for the first time. So that was really important. And there's a couple other really um, important items that also occurred. Well, the League of Nations was yeah. established, and that was a remarkable accomplishment following World War I when uh, it was important for the world to come back together again after such a long and arduous uh, war that just took so many lives. And that was a valiant effort. Um, certainly, World War II occurred, but after that, we developed the United Nations. So that was the original concept and, uh, I think, built a platform or foundation for what came uh, eventually uh, when the United Nations was developed. And I'm going to make one little last minute, like, um, shout out, if you will. And this is, this is at the cusp of the 1930s. And in 1937, our beloved Uptown Theater opened for the first time. And of course, it's closed right now, but it's only a couple blocks away. That was my theater as a kid here, and now it hosts wonderful musicians. And then looking down, TV. TV. So the theater opened, and yep. ABC TV was broadcasting for the first time from the University of Iowa. From Iowa. I have an interesting story about that. Yeah. The man who invented the raster screen, that design that picked up the image, was the son of a farmer. Really? And the design, or the, the image that he had in his mind when he created it, resembled row crops. Oh. And the idea of scanning developed television. That is amazing. So from farming to television. Wow, that's amazing. Well, shall we go into the Just Down Memorial Room and meet uh, our two historians? Let's Scott get started. Started. Okay, let's, let's go. And so here we have our wonderful historians, Don Winter on our left, and Scott Sedgley on our right, Dr. Hunter, would you and Don like to start 
um, with the tour and Scott, they'll meet up with you and I'll stay and I'll stand back. How about that? That sounds very good. Thank you. Okay, so tonight, our, the tour tonight is going to showcase the work of uh, over a dozen authors. We're very lucky in collaboration with Arcadia Publishing that has produced over 20 volumes, historic volumes, and really is the product of local historians uh, who researched uh, the life in the valley and have told many different stories. And we're hoping that this exhibit will inspire more, more, more research, and more of you sharing some of your family stories and uh, building on this incredible work and knowledge that we value so much in knowing what has happened in the valley and who was where, who was here, and how it worked, how it happened. So the, the, the exhibit is organized into five main themes. The first theme of the Napa Valley and the earliest uh, towns that were established. We have a section talking about people and the families that were here. Then we talk about the livelihoods, the way in which people earned a living and sustained themselves, some of the professions and industries that developed. And then we look at some of the fun side of life because life was hard and lots of work going on, but certainly there was time for fun. And that, that is something that in the Valley. And finally, at Statehood, when Napa County became one of the first 27 counties established by the state of California, we're gonna look a little bit at the government services that were provided to the residents of the Valley. So we're looking tonight at, there are four publications actually that Arcadia has uh, put out for us. One is about Napa County overall. We have one telling the story of Zaylina, Calistoga, and Yorkville. Certainly uh, these eight uh, towns that we are highlighting are among the earliest of Napa City founded in 1847. Uh, and then through the 60s and 70s, the last are Anglin and Napa Junction. I think Don was interested to see this map and see what we put up, and uh, you had some other comments about it. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Hunter. And these wonderful Arcadia books also explore to include Silverado City, a silver mining town on the flanks of Mount St. Helena. The agricultural thriving community of Monticello, which is now lies under the waters of Lake Berryessa. And finally, Knoxville, a very, very busy mining town in the northeast corner of Napa County. So, part of the exhibit is actually um, made or built from the collections of objects that have been donated to the Historical Society over time. These are wonderful family treasures that have been passed down from generation to generation. And they're typical of the kinds of things that we hold on to that help us to remember the good times that we had when we were younger and other kinds of events that were really special moments in family life. Um, on the top shelf, we have yearbooks and things that are reflecting of school and education, which happened very early in the Valley, very important for young families who wanted to see their children uh, well-educated, learning to read and, uh, um, and do math and learn their history. <laughs> so um, we have the, the school bell from Salvador. And I think that's really iconic because, you know, most of us grew up with bells, electric bells, but a uh, few of us ever heard a teacher calling the kids to the classroom with the bell, but that's, that's what they did back then. On the second shelf, we have some objects that were very graciously loaned to us by the Chinese Historical Society in San Francisco, showing us some of the everyday objects that revolved around social life. Um, we have a set of dominoes, uh, playing cards. In the center there, we have some very minute, small medicine bottles, typical uh, uh, cultural traditions in treating different uh, illnesses and ailments. And on the right, in the far right, we have a very beautiful and fragile hand-painted porcelain dish. So we really are grateful to the 
Historical Society in San Francisco for sharing those with us. On the bottom shelf is a very interesting collection of watches and personal effects. And I want to point out in the, in the uh, corner here, uh, the object, the uh, personal effects that belong to D.T. Davis. D Mr. Davis was eventually became the superintendent of schools uh, in uh, Napa. Prior to that, however, he was a school teacher and a beloved school teacher. And um, I think it's really important as we think about uh, teachers and the role they play in educating our children. And certainly these days in COVID when many families now are struggling with children trying to learning going without the teacher. And we now understand what an invaluable role they play in assuring that children are well prepared for adulthood. And then there's a lot of that to be seen in this exhibit. Um, we had some souvenir plates that were created uh, for, as mementos of the valley, including one that depicts the courthouse. These are kinds of things that would be sold to visitors and, uh, and were very popular at one point in time. So here we're looking at the people that came to the valley. When the gold rush brought hundreds of thousands of people to California, many of them did go to the gold fields, but some did not. Some actually came and, and made their way by becoming traders and suppliers and working to support the gold miners. And they actually made quite a prosperous living. And eventually they opened storefronts, including the Tanasha grocery store here. The, up above we have Hoddles and uh, then Wyckoff and Greece. These were typical of the kinds of commerce and merchants that were springing up all throughout the valley in the different towns, reflecting the needs of the community and the resources and working together with farmers and ranchers which was a big aspect of the history of the valley. You know, in the earliest part of uh, the valley's um, enterprises, the Juarez family, which um, were uh, during the Mexican period, this was uh, during uh, 1830 to 1848, we were uh, part of Alta California, which was under Mexican rule. And uh, the land grant was the main way to acquire land and the Juarez family was very successful. They received a grant of 8,800 acres and ran a cattle and farming operation. Um, Mr. Juarez uh, married uh, Maria Higuera, also the daughter of a Mexican soldier. And together they raised 11 children, most of whom married American immigrants. The Juarez family were major benefactors to early Napa. And in fact, the Juarez family donated the land upon which the famous Tulake Cemetery, a park in a cemetery, is now founded. They were entrepreneurial. They had an interest in the famous Napa Hotel. And the son was an owner and operator of Napa's first movie theater. And their remembrance still is with us because the famous old adobe on Sosco is uh, preserved by the Altamura family as the original adobe in Napa County. And uh, all Napa, and if you look at their visages, they all look like movie stars and they had a great impact. And you want to learn more about them, you come down to see us. So the life. The life that was led here is so much revolved around families, and that was an important part of this exhibit. We, when we think about founding of cities and towns, we often look to the founding fathers and the leaders in business and commerce. But really, when you think about it, it really is about families and the strength of the families in sustaining these enterprises. They were large families, and they needed to be because there were so many hardships, often not all the children would survive. And so you would see families 
uh, sometimes more than a dozen children. And so mothers pictured here as Holmes family, it's a very sweet photo, something very familiar to everyone. It's almost like she's tickling the little one trying to get her to smile for the photo. But often the photos were much more formal and uh, posed. And here we see the family, uh, but we see three generations uh, pose in a beautiful setting, um, guessing it's their front yard and looking very stately. Um, and that, that's what people did. Uh, they took photographs to memorialize the family. Uh, and, uh, we're very proud to show the many generations that they were supporting. The Asian immigrants that came to the valley were part of the gold rush, but unfortunately, by 1853, California had feelings about foreign miners and among them the Asians. And so they passed a foreign miner tax, which was so onerous that many were forced out of the gold fields and saw us and launched out to find other ways to earn a living. Those that came to the Napa Valley became very integral to the economy here. They became part of the farming operations. They were construction of all kinds of, 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 uh, of edifices and walls and bridges. And then later, of course, they became part of the railroad um, effort building the railroad. On the cover of Hidden History of Napa Valley is the Joss House, which was a spiritual center and a social center for the Chinese community in Napa City itself. They also ran a laundry. They ran a general store that was owned by the Chan family, which was a very well-known enterprise. Beginning, I, I meant to include to the beginning in 1882, uh, the, um, the United States passed a series of laws that prohibited Chinese immigration until 1943. So there were some hard feelings for a long time, but I think it's, it's well known uh, the contribution of the Asian community to the growth and development of Napa. And then we have um, my friends and fellow historians, Nelson, wrote this wonderful book, Chronicling the Jewish Contributions in History in Napa County. And Congregation Beth Shalom is one of our esteemed sponsors for this entire. So folks, if you want to learn more about this incredible heritage and meet the authors, come on down and see us in November, where they will be uh, giving a live presentation for all of our benefit. This is the second case in the exhibit. And in this case, we really get a chance to see the records and transactions that were going on by the business community conducting their, their uh, transactions and commerce, the growth of commerce. Um, on the top shelf, we can see the schedules for the train, the ferry, and some of the other ways in which um, produce and other raw bulk goods were being moved around. We have ledgers showing the actual individual transactions and supplies and purchases. And we see uh, handwritten notations recording the business operations. Um, there's a lovely, very fancy spur there, which I'm sure was not a working version, but certainly cowboys in the valley were very important to the farming and ranching operations. And we have a few things here reflecting the wine industry. We've got a very old 1890 wood and metal corkscrew and we have some foils that are very beautiful colors deep rich colors that were used in bottling and I think probably the most interesting thing to me is the wine pairing guide that was put out by the Charles Krug winery on the bottom shelf we start to look at the Sawyer operation on the right a large ledger showing again the transactions that were being recorded uh, and showing the immense activity that was going on. Um, in the lower left corner is a very unusual object.
which is from the collection, and it is a glove die cut that was used for creating gloves. And there we see finished gloves below it. Very interesting to see what the cut looked like before the finished glove was completed. In the bottom, very center, is a press that was used to mark the sidewalks by Mr. Imbonen. And I think those of you that have grown up in the valley, you have seen that marked on many sidewalks in your lifetime. Now we're going to transition to livelihoods and the way in which people earn a living. Certainly cataracts, which was established in the Mexican era, continued on and was a staple of the economy. Cattle, horses, and later sheep were raised very successfully and of course contributed to the leather cannery business that eventually developed. There were chicken ranches, there were dairies, in the early days, especially during the Mexican era, grain and oats and barley were, were a big a part of the agricultural production. At one time, Napa Valley produced 10% of all grains that were grown across the United States. Can you think of that a small valley like this producing 10% of all grains that were being produced? And up above, we see images of fruit uh, being dried and berries being picked. The fruit uh, agricultural economy was really developed by the European immigrants who recognized the climate and the uh, opportunity. Once they started growing fruit, it became a rare and valued commodity, especially once the trains were in place and freight was shipped to the East Coast and these uh, very uh, special fruits were very much appreciated by folks on the East Coast who didn't have such things year-round as we do here. I have here an unusual photo of a cinnabar sluice box. Mining is certainly uh, very important to the valley, and I think we can hear more about it from Don. Thank you, Monica. While most are familiar with the preeminent role of agriculture and hospitality since the beginning in Napa, mineral extraction also played a huge part in our economy and in development. There were significant amounts of gold in our hills, widespread silver mining. We also have petroleum, iron, um, coal, and on the more ominous side, we were one of the major producers of mercury in the entire world. And the cinnabar mines and the smelting and extraction purpose processes were largely centered in Northeast Napa, but the daily newspapers quantified how many flasks of mercury Napa County produced every single day. And then on the most ominous side, Napa was also a major asbestos miner. Tremendous. So all of these activities really revolve around the fact that Napa City was located on the Napa River, which made so many things possible. It was the backbone of transportation. Certainly, uh, horse and cart were essential to moving products from the interior of the valley down to the waterfront. But once it got there, how did it move? Scott's going to tell us about that. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, the Napa River. Uh, I grew up on the Napa River. Uh, we called ourselves river rats. In the 50s and 60s, it wasn't really a river we swam in. But, but it was a paradise for young boys along the banks and the tributaries to the river. And, you know, this, this whole discussion could have very well started with the river because uh, like Monica said, water and river waterways are essential to any community and civilization. So think of the Napa River as a, a stem of a wine glass, uh, the Y-shaped stem of a wine glass. For the northernmost end of our county, you have the forested mountains of the Mayacanas, and on the west side and on the east side, you have the rocky hillsides of the Palisades. 
and that all cascades down into the headwaters of the Napa River, which begin at the foot of Mount St. Helena. 55 miles long is the Napa River. 53 tributaries carry the water downstream into the San Pablo Bay. The last 17 miles, which basically starts at Napa City into the bay, travel through a series of wetlands and estuaries. It was just a, a haven for waterfowl and 34 different species of fish all found that home in those wetlands. And the wetlands are being restored uh, magnificently today to their former glory. But you know, nothing would have happened without transportation and the Napa River was our interstate of the time. Everything moved in and out on the Napa River. Between 1865 and 1915, there were no less than 45 steam paddle wheelers and schooners that brought hides out, timber out, and brought other goods into the valley. Paddle wheelers with the names of the Zinfandel were, were synonymous, and Albert Hack was one of our great riverfront captains. So, you know, the, the river has been integral to our community forever, uh, but when the railroad arrived in the turn of the century, the river became less critical for commerce. Uh, it became a bit of a nuisance because it would often flood, and it became a bit of a, a dumping ground for some of the industry, some of the, you know, the byproducts of al uh, agriculture. All those things were easily disposed of in the river. The river became very polluted. That's why, as young boys, we didn't swim in it much. It was a very dangerous river to swim in. But it, it, in 1998, the voters of Napa County passed Measure A. And what Measure A did was create a flood, district, a flood control project that was going to bring the health of the river back to its glory and, and vitalize our community. Now today you can go along the river and you'll see an occasional harbor seal that makes, it way, makes its way up the river. You'll see beaver colonies in the tributaries right downtown. And you'll see one thing that the Napa River has never seen in its history are paddle borders on the Napa River. So we're excited about that. But you know, every community needs a river. We have ours. It's seen phases. It's as healthy and beautiful now. We're utilizing it. But we want to move on a little bit and talk about a little of the industry that helped uh, damage the river by the industry around its shoreline. And those were our tanning industries. Uh, Napa was known for its vibrant tanneries. Uh, Napa leather was patented here. N-A-P-P-A -P -P -A, Napa leather, high quality leather. So Monica, I think you're going to carry on a little bit about the uh, tanning industry and some of the other work in our community. Yes. You know, um, I'm glad you brought that up about the quality of the weather. And while there were downsides, all of these industries had downsides, of course, and we've learned so much about well, how to protect our environment and still carry on vibrant um, economic activities. But I think one of the things that we value about these industries, especially in uh, times when women had so few opportunities to work and earn a living outside the home. So we have here an image of three women working in the glove company. Um, no, I'm not sure you can see, uh, but they're all dressed up. They have flowers in their hair. They knew they were gonna be photographed that day. But you can see the sewing machine sitting there and a huge, probably a foot high spool of thread. So again, I think there were opportunities for all Napa residents to gain from the many different businesses that were springing up over time. The wine industry certainly employed hundreds of people as they do today. Uh, in the earliest of times, these uh, wineries were largely started by immigrants from Europe, from Italy, from uh, France, and from Germany, and Austria, Switzerland where they had um, experience and knowledge of uh, growing vines and uh, the crush, the uh, barrel uh, fermentation, and finally bottling. We have uh, found images here of two of the most well-known, the Behringer 
uh, group here, proudly standing in front of what seems to be a very large and beautiful building. And up above we have what we think is a crew working at the Krug Winery. Uh, and we can see some of the equipment, some of the big, large, crushing um, uh, uh, devices uh, they're standing in front of. I'm sure that's their daily workplace. And up in the corner we have uh, Mr. Um, Anthony, and I'm blanking on his name. I'm sorry. Nicolini. Antonini uh, Nicolini. Nicolini. Up in the corner we have Mr. Nicolini, who's very proudly standing in a vineyard in the 1920s. And we know that uh, the 1920s, during the 1920s, we experienced prohibition uh, when the 18th Amendment was passed. And we'll hear a little bit more about prohibition when we uh, round the corner here. Um, but at the turn of the century, we, we read in the history that there were well over 140 wineries that were operating. Not all of them survived uh, prohibition, but we'll talk more about that. And finally, we have a couple more areas where people were, I mean, let me flip around here. We have a couple more areas where people were employed and um, began to develop different kinds of professions. Certainly banking and financial services was something that was missing here in the Valley until 1958 when George Goodman and his brother James started the Goodman Bank, which was the only bank in the Valley until 1871. So they really provided an essential service. And note these dapper young men here. Women were not working in banks back then, but these days, of course, they do. And then another very important uh, area and uh, providing many, many jobs, uh, as well as the professions, the medical professions, was the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, when the uh, asylum was built, California's largest asylum was built here because of the natural environment and the belief that being outdoors in healthy, natural settings was very recuperative and therapeutic. Uh, we also had the uh, veterans home that was built in Yachtville at the other end of the valley um, for the same reason. Both of these facilities were very large and housed many hundreds of patients. Uh, the, the patients at the, uh, the asylum actually worked on the grounds. There were gardens, there were dairies, and there were other ways, the lumber yard, or other ways in which they worked. And then people were employed in the bakery, the kitchen, the amusement hall, the drugstore, the kitchens, and the dining rooms. And it's worth noting that both the veterans home and the asylum were recognized as among the most significant architectural achievements in Northern California. Um, they're both still operating to this day. And as Monica mentioned, the basic premise of the insane asylum was occupational therapy, wherein all of the inmates were required to work and contribute to the success and sustainability of the overall uh, venture. And that went on well into the uh, 20th century. So uh, if you look at the uh, Arcadia books, you'll see many representations of both the uh, veterans home and the asylum as they continually changed and uh, portions were demolished and new ones arose. But it's just some fascinating architecture and a wealth of personal stories within each. So John, let's take a look at what people did for fun because clearly these kinds of, of uh, ways of earning a living were very labor intensive and very hard working people sustained seven day work weeks, no doubt. So, in the valley, there were many, many seasonal festivals, and these were enormously important and popular for socializing and getting together with neighbors and family. Certainly when the circus came to town, that was a time when everybody wanted to be able to join the show and watch the ring leader, the ring master, launch the show, start the show. There was Chinese New Year, 
there was a Fourth of July, and we see the Donahue sisters up above all dressed up. And people did that frequently. They fashioned a costume uh, reflecting the season. They would decorate their buggy and uh, horse and cart, or bicycle in this case. Later, automobiles would be covered with flowers and ribbons, and they all show up. And then there would be the parade, and with the parade was a band. One of the earliest bands was the band of the Juarez Rancho. They held annual rodeos, which were extremely popular in the valley, and you had to have the music to go with it. Pictured also here is St. Helena Concert Band. Many of the towns had bands, and certainly later the high school bands filled in when, uh, band, when music was needed down the main street of each town. Also, again, enjoying the climate here and the beautiful oak groves and sloping hills, people love to go picnicking, and they often did in large groups. I'm really impressed here. These are all very young folks that have gathered. They drag a photographer out with them to show off how they were going to enjoy their afternoon. And often people even camped out. Here we've got a horse a mother and her young child, and dad is holding on to the family pet, which they were really out for fun, possibly more than a weekend. Who knows? It looks like they have pretty good stores there. But if you didn't like the outdoors, if that just wasn't for you, Napa was full of hotels. So Don, why don't you tell us about that? Thank you, Monica. Since the very beginning, Napa County has always been a resort and hotel destination area. In fact, in the 1880s, there were more hotel rooms per capita in Napa than there are today. In this display, we see a number of the iconic hotels, and sadly, if you can focus on the White Sulphur Springs Hotel, this was the first hotel and resort in the state of California. It opened in 1852. For Napa City itself, the first building in Napa City in 1848 was the Empire Saloon. The second building in Napa City was the Empire Hotel. New hotels popped up, new resorts uh, popped up. Here we show one of the most famous resorts in the Western United States, the famed Napa Soda Springs Resort. Not only was it a playground for the wealthy, but they shipped their carbonated waters to fine restaurants throughout uh, Europe. We also have Etten Springs Hotel, which ran for 98 consecutive years out in Polk Valley. The White Sulphur Springs Hotel, the first one, sadly to say, two days ago, the successive buildings burned to the ground in the glass fires. And we're all saddened to see the, this piece of history. But it's gone through so many transformations, we know that it will be rebuilt. Here we have the Sebastopol Hotel. You may know that Yountville for many years was not known as Yountville, it was called Sebastopol. George C. Yount didn't want it named after himself. We have the Alexandria Hotel in downtown Napa. And uh, our hotel and restaurant industry, which throughout most of our history was not paired with the wine industry, is now enjoying a symbiotic relationship with the wine industry and both significant industries profit from that close association and attraction. So here we have the third case and in this case we start to talk a little bit more about what happened uh, once California became a state. But to finish off what Don was talking about, we have a little bit of some of the uh, att attractions that brought people to the Nampa Valley. Uh, we had, Calistoga of course had the what's called the Valley of the Geysers, and people were thrilled to come uh, to actually witness this explosion coming out of the earth. It was quite exciting. Um, we've got pictorial histories, and we've got here, back here, we had, there were lots of kinds of sporting clubs. There were bicycle clubs, there were boxing cl uh, clubs, and here we have a Coast League uh, baseball signed. I'm not sure who signed it because 
Let's see, this says circa 1910, so we don't know which team it was. But um, again, you know, the leather industry was producing not only garments and gloves, but they actually produced leather that was used for baseball, which is a very special kind of leather, as well as producing baseball gloves. So those were the kinds of things that contributed to the sports. As far as once uh, the state was declared and Napa became the county, uh, and Napa City became the seat for the county, elections were held. So we've got some, we've got a poster here for you showing Charles Jackson who ran as a Republican for Superior Court judge. And we also have some, a certificate here certifying the election, some ballots, interestingly enough, a poll tax receipt in the amount of $2, which seems pretty high to me for the privilege of voting. We've got a book issuing liquor licenses, uh, obviously before 1920. And down below, we have um, a, a, a very early um, uh, example of, of police handcuffs and uh, the sheriff's uh, or marshal's badge that was worn, and a, a, a very um, elaborately decorated uh, police baton and recalling that back then we called them peace officers because that's what they were and that's what they still are. And we value the police and they have uh, contributed uh, to just maintaining order in our society. Um, so let's move on to this final panel. We could, let me swing around this way. Once, once the county began to develop services for the community, there were a number of things that were initiated. First of all, rural mail delivery was taking place with um, horse and buggy. And here we have a photograph of a very proud mailman. Um, <clears throat> we all know the motto of the post office, and we hope to see that our post office today survives and carries on the fine tradition of making sure that the mail is moving quickly and, and reaching its intended uh, recipients. Um, above, we've got a picture of the Goodman Public Library, the building we're standing in. When this building was built in 1901 by the Goodman family, they deeded the land as well as uh, built the building. And it was two floors. The top floor, which still holds the collections, was set for the library. But downstairs there was a, a woman's tea room and a male uh, men's billiard room, which later became a children's library room. So we were very grateful to the Goodman. This is such a beautiful building and it's, we're lucky that it survived all these many years. Police and fire, again, there's something that all civil society relies on peace and order and the police department here was um, at, in, by 1850, we were seeing elections for marshals, uh, sheriff, judges, justice of the peace, uh, and constables. Um, in the early days, people were voted in on uh, party tickets that ended uh, later, and we no longer have partisan elections for these kinds of offices. We've got a fabulous photo here of the fire chief dressed up like a policeman. Um, but we really didn't have a police, uh, pardon me, we really didn't have a fire department until 1906 when the city of Napa, uh, by the way, changed its name in 1874, and they finally formalized the fire department. Prior to that, and you can see here in this photo from the 1890s, the fire department was really essentially volunteers mainly made up from the business community. So the downtown businessmen would be on alert during fire season and they would not hesitate to run out the door and run for the hoses and do what they could to protect uh, both lives and uh, structures. Uh, up above, we've got a pretty happy looking group up there of firemen uh, posing for a picture in front of the bakery. Uh, I don't know, police? They seem to be the ones hanging out in the bakery. In this picture, it's the firemen. Um, and then above, we've got the courthouse, which was built six years after 
the county was started. An interesting point of this very elaborate building was that it was actually built back east and shipped west and then put in place. And inside that courthouse on the second floor was the first jail. And I suspect the police were very happy to have a place to put unruly people who just weren't cooperative. One important um, moment in time reflected here on the wall is this political poster from the general election in 1910. And in the center of this image or this poster is Margaret Melvin, who was nominated for superintendent of schools of the county. And she actually was elected to be superintendent. The most interesting thing about it is that in 1910, Miss Melvin could not vote in that election because women did not get the right to vote until 1920. So while they couldn't vote, apparently they could run for office. And we're very glad that we've had 100 years now of women voting. And below we've got a picture of some females working in the clerk's office. So again, there were professions that were open to women, not everything. Eventually, women made their way, but we certainly bow our or tip our hat <laughs> to Miss Melvin for being among those leaders who stepped into community life and did, provided uh, civic service to her community. And um, let's see, we've got something up here about the prohibition. A great story about our history. Um, this is a wonderful book describing the ups and downs of the effects of prohibition. Now, our burgeoning wine industry was devastated in the 1890s by the outbreak of Paloxo. So most of the vineyards were destroyed, wine production got down to zilch, eventually they brought in new rootstock, new viticultural methods, and our wine industry started flourishing, only to be hit, be hit by the Volstead Act and prohibition. Most wineries shut down, went bankrupt, found alternative agricultural pursuits, but not all of them showed down. And we uh, actually manufactured alcohol in many forms. And in fact, while the wine industry was shut down, the hotel industry flourished because Napa County was known as a wide open county. And residents throughout Northern California would come up for the weekend and check into hotels and then load the trunks of their cars with bootleg liquor and wine. So it wasn't all bad for all industries. And unfortunately, after repeal, the major beverage dis distributor in Napa County, a famous hotelier, somehow found vast quantities of beer on hand the day prohibition was repealed. It's a great Napa story. It certainly is. It's very much in keeping with the, with the culture of the valley. So the last little series of photos here uh, represent military life. And in California, at statehood, uh, the, um, the, um, the California State Constitution in 1849 uh, established military service, and later in, in 1903, the Militia Act created the California National Guard. We have an image here of the National Guard encampment that was here in Napa. And on this side over here, we've got a, an image of the Napa National Guard hospital camp. Note that we have sailors as well as army and um, it looks like we have some uh, medical folks there too. Um, what, what is really important about those sailors is they reflect the fact that Mare Island was built in 1853, very early, and was the first large naval shipyard on the west coast, located here, just a few miles down the, down the river um, in San Pablo Bay. And, um, Mare Island has employed hundreds and hundreds of uh, Napa residents over the 100, more than 160 years, 180 years possibly, that, that, that has been in existence until 1996 when Mare Island was officially closed and it was given to the city of Vallejo. During the time that it was in operation, it was home port 
to sailing vessels, its early days, steam vessels, and later more modern vessels of war. So it's, a, it's been an important um, aspect of uh, employment, certainly, and a connection to the military for the valley. And finally, I want to close with a very poignant image that is from the collection, uh, and it is of Armistice Day in 1918. And I feel sadness for, and when I look at this picture, just as I feel sadness today for all of us who are enduring through this pandemic and hoping that each of our families is safe and that we are looking forward to a time when this pandemic will no longer be, uh, you know, something that we have to contend with. And let's hope that that happens very quickly and let's hope that our families remain safe and our communities stay strong and that we hold together and that we do everything possible to protect ourselves and our community as we wait for a vaccine and um, the path back to some kind of new normal. We don't know what that will be yet, but it will be a time when everyone will be uh, relieved and rejoice. So we have another exhibit in the hall uh, that's also here tonight and will continue on beyond this exhibit. And we I'm going to turn it over to Lou. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Um, over in this corner, you passed up with the voices. And this is part of an exhibit called Echoes of the Valley. It focuses on four um, things. It, right now, it started in August 15th, and right now it's Women in the Valley. This is available both online through our website at NapaHistory.org, and we have a new sound cone that is here that was provided by California Reveal, the full project by the California Reveal. The sound cone is wonderful and how it emits the sound and the echoes of the past. And so once we finish uh, Women in the Valley, which will finish on October 15th, we're going to hear more of the riverboats and the river. That's going to go from October 15th to December 15th. Following, it'll be the Working Pioneers from January 15th to March 15th, and it'll end um, with architects, architectural highlights, which is a popular um, for many people, um, and that will go from March 15th to May 15th. Again, this is available both on our website at NapaHistory.org and here inside the Goodman at the Just Goodman Memorial Hall through our sound cone. So we hope you come here and, and experience this. And speaking of, you can, starting on uh, Saturday, October 3rd, tomorrow, the Goodman will be open. Our physical doors will be open for you to come in. Now we'll be, we'll be keeping very strict um, COVID-19 guidelines. So do come with your face cover, do come with, within your family bubble. Otherwise we will watch and, and, and help you keep your social distance to keep everybody safe. But come in and enjoy this extraordinary exhibit of who tells our story in person. You can spend a lot of time here and you're welcome to come back anytime. Our doors are open and free to the public and you'll be able to see and, and enjoy the timeline further. I want to thank um, all our sponsors again tonight. Um, Arcadia Press, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, thank you um, to the Congregation of Beth Shalom. Thank you to Doctors Company who's actually sponsored this exhibit and our following exhibit. And then also we want to thank Ages Living um, Napa. Now, it was a true tradition when we opened a, a special a, an exhibit, we have a toast. So let's, I think we have Mr. Uh, Winter here that's got some bubbly prepared for a toast. So we hope you will grab whatever is nearby and in spirit and in person so join us at home in this toast, a toast to history, to its collection, to its preservation, and to its communication, and to making history, and the Napa County Historical Society has now made history with this truly wondrous exhibit. We look forward to seeing you down here at the Goodman Building for the next few weeks 
we're here to greet you. We can't wait to see you. This is an amazing exhibit. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Do your help. Cheers. Cheers.